thing on. Can everybody hear? Yep. We're given a big task today, Brent Murs, Boyd Lear, and I, to explain what's happened over the last couple of years. And the interesting thing is, is that if you look at weather patterns in <coughs> western Kansas, this isn't the worst drought. In some cases, maybe it is. But it's been a huge challenge. But your co-op has continued to prosper through that. And so our challenge today is to report to you and explain how does your co-op work when it's not raining? So I, what's, what's so special about the Garden City Co-op? Two years ago, Gary Friesen from Scott Co-op and I were sitting at a table at the Arthur Capra Cooperative Center, and we had a provocative speaker. And he didn't, he didn't do business with his local co-op. And, and his job was there to spur us on and, and evaluate what we were doing to make ourselves relevant to a big farmer such as he was. And as he went through his speech, one of the things he finally said was, so do you people, we were all cooperative managers and employees, do you people think that there's something special about a co-op? Is it something magical? And those words have haunted me for two years. <coughs> And so I believe there is, and that's what I'm here today to try and explain some of the magic. But the first thing is, rather than just ratios, let's talk about some cool stuff about the Garden City Co-op. In a good year, we'll handle 30 million bushels of grain. Now that's, you know, at a thousand bushels a truck, that's 60 or 30,000 trucks in and 30,000 trucks out. So how many is 60,000 trucks? What would that look like? Well, if they all showed up the same day, if all 30,000 of your trucks showed up and behind them was 30,000 Wind River trucks outbound, the line would reach from Garden City to Corpus Christi, Texas, which as it's reported by a lot of you farmers in the Gano area, that's about what your harvest line looks like. <laughs> I think that's an exaggeration, but I feel your pain. But stop and think about what the group that Boyd just recognized, the group of employees and all those that are out at their position today couldn't be here. It's a big job when you stop and think about it all happening at one day and all the coordination and all the tickets and everything that happens. So how much stuff do we handle? Well, if we took a good wheat crop, we produce enough wheat to make seven and a half billion hamburger buns. We could provide a hamburger bun for every person in the world. We provide enough corn and milo to local feedlots that if you took the weight that we put on steers, that weight added at local feedlots, not the total weight of the sphere, but what we add would create 243 million hamburgers. So we could get everybody in the United States almost a hamburger. That's pretty hard to think about. Seven billion people, you know, 300 million Americans all eating hamburgers. So what if we had a hamburger fry for Garden City, Kansas. Well, we could feed one hamburger to everybody in Garden City every day for 20 years. <coughs> and we'd still have seven and a quarter billion <laughs> buns left over, <laughs> which may have something to do with why they invented chicken sandwiches in the first place. <laughs> or maybe that's the whole hot dog and bun deal working, I'm not sure. But if you stop and think about it, what, we, what you do, what you produce in one year that we handle for you would feed this community every day for 20 years. We handle a lot of stuff. Now, I hadn't thought about all this until last week Bob Almas' wife, Sandy, asked me to come and speak to a fourth grade class. And I wasn't sure what to tell fourth graders about the Garden City Co-op until I started to think about what we do. So I've been your manager for 10 years. This is the first time it occurred to me how much stuff goes on and what this group of employees actually do. 
So it is magic. That guy was wrong. There is something magic about the Garden City Co-op and about the cooperative movement as a whole. Let's look. Everybody knows what grain receipts look like through dry years, through wet years. Lots of volatility, ranging all the way from, uh, you know, recently a low of 15 million bushels up to 35 million bushels. So that's a lot of volatility. Brent made reference to the, to the lender, and we have several lenders here. If there's one thing lenders don't like, it's a lot of volatility. They like to know what's going to happen next year, so how do we assure them as the Garden City Co-op that we're a good partner and we're a good investment? We've materially changed our business, that's how, and it is magic. Here is, from 2005 to 2013, and so the red line is the grain purchases for any given year. And as you can see, the cash savings, Brent explained how we're figuring cash now, which really removes depreciation expense, so we get a more accurate idea of what's going on in our business. Not surprising to anybody, for years and years and years, the co-op's prosperity was closely tied to your production. If you had big harvest, we made big money. If you didn't have a big harvest, we didn't make big money. But a couple of years ago, through some of the structural things that our board has allowed us to do, we've changed that. And now you see the savings line continue on, even through some challenging years. And so, that's an exciting trend. Now, it'll be interesting when you come back next year, and hopefully this is recovered because we're expecting a bigger and bigger harvest. We had a better harvest this fall harvest, and wheat looks good. Can we maintain that spread? And when the grain comes up, the savings goes up as well. That's our plan. I'll let you know next year. Brent talks about $28.5 million that we've invested since 2009. We've added 800,000 bushel to the Shields location. We've added over 800,000 bushel to the Wolf location. We've added 800,000 bushel to the Deerfield location. All highly efficient concrete, <coughs> new legs and two of them. Um, and a new crop production facility that I just got an email yesterday that finally all of our permitting is done and we're ready to open for business. That's a lot of stuff over the last few years. And then the big one. Our new facility that we're so proud of, south of town. Tom Lear said something to me before the, the meeting that I want to relate to you. And that is the Garden City Co-op and ag retailers in general have come to the farm year after year and said, come do business with us. You come to us. Well, we've moved south of town now and we're saying, please do business with us because we're coming to you. And we can't be more excited about having a new facility in a long time underserved area. But we're not going to stop there. So coming soon, by next fall harvest, we're going to have a brand new facility that looks just like Climel at Rock Island, which is located eight miles north of Hickok, or just northeast of Ulysses. It's very similar to Climel. It's in the, it's in the middle of a, a sustainable, highly productive, good water area, and it answers a question that we've had for, what, Lynn, 30 years or more at an elevator that we couldn't get trucks in and out of a Hickok. It's a great solution. And it came from down within the ranks how to solve the problem. Don't keep adding on to a bad situation and make it worse. Go out and fix it. Now this one, this is low. I'd like to say that's what it looks like right now. Kim would like to say that's what it'll look like by next wheat harvest, but it won't. This is actually some photoshopping. The elevator ends right there today. 
But with a little luck and some weather, by next year, when you show up at the low elevator, we'll have a new leg and another million bushel. So that's good. I mean, it's good that your co-op's doing well. It's good that your co-op's making investments in it. But all this new storage costs a lot of money. How does that affect you on the farm? Well, we've added 5.4 million bushels of new storage. So do the math on that. That's 5,400 trucks that you're not in line with. So that saves about 15 days worth of scale time that we used to make you wait while we got the grain out so we could let you in. Those trucks aren't showing up during your harvest. They're still showing up. They just show up when you're not there. The other thing it does, we need to be profitable. We need to keep doing um, the right kind of things, and part of that is Ken's excellent job in the past of marketing grain. Well, this allows him more flexibility. One of the problems we have is, and we'll still be challenged with this, but not to the extent, when we have a late wheat harvest and a dry land corn crop and you don't have any time to turn those elevators around, how do you do it? Well, we do the best we can and then we start emptying trucks during corn harvest. This allows us a little more space, a little more time to get out of your way so when you're gear up, you're going. And more importantly, it allows us to control our own situation. We get to sell grain when we want to, not when we have to to accommodate you. Those are the facilities. $28.5 million worth of facilities to this point. In the next year, $14 million worth of new facilities. And not one of them works without the right employees. So here is the magic part. We've talked about ratios, we've talked about facts and figures, you know, well, in medicine, sometimes medical tests tell the doctor how the patient's doing, sometimes they use it at the autopsy to figure out what happened. What we really need are ratios that tell us what's about to happen. How good is it going to get? Well, let me give you some of those about our people. When you show up at the heart, at the elevator, and there are clouds in the west, and you want to get some more loads in, that's no time for a rook. When you are um, having a bug challenge out in the field, that's no time to ask a rook what to do. When you're trying to prepare for your tax season, and you want your billing statements to be right, and all those kind of things, that's no time for a rookie to be doing that. So we made improvements in all those areas, and we did it because we've got excellent, committed, long-term employees. Let me give you a couple of ratios or figures about how that works. This fall alone, we have done employer verification on six employees that were getting a mortgage for a new house. Now that says to me, there's a person that's planning on making a career here, and there's somebody that we can count on for the next 20, 30, in Ken's case, 40 years. <laughs> we had, uh, we unfortunately do lose some employees from time to time. And, and we have a great location manager that, that is moving into a business with his family and going to leave us. Now, that's a location manager. We have 127 employees. In most organizations, that's just one of the things that happen. We were so shaken by that, that actually shows up in the board report. The chief operation officer reports to the board, gosh, we've got a great employee and we're going to lose him, and so we're going to have to go out and find another one. That's the level that we take turnover at. But the best story that I can tell you is we have an employee that is way past retirement, whose health is finally making him retire. And he had a conversation with a 21-year-old employee out of low. And he said, you know what? 
You need to stay here and make your career. This is a great place to work. I've been here 20 years. It's, it's the best thing that happened, and, and I hope you will do the same thing. And the employee said, yeah, that's what my dad tells me too. <laughs> so the way that it works, and I'm glad Boyd had everybody stand up. I won't make them go up and down, but I'm proud to be a part of this team. I'm proud to work for this board of directors that has our interests at heart. I'm proud to be part of the team that serves you. And when you look into the future, we can build new stuff, we can, we can commit to your business, but none of it works without the people that make it work. And that's why I'm so proud that so many of you are there. And I hope you'll come back and, and tell your coworkers how, how much we appreciate the job that they all do. A year ago, I showed this, and this is the one picture that took the crowd's breath. I don't think he, nobody remembers what I said last year, but everybody remembers Kevin Dixon's grandson. Well, it's a year later, and the poor guy, he's got a lot on his mind. <laughs> I mean, the, the toll of time is really wearing, he's still wearing the Garden City Co-op, but boy, that guy's about puckered out. So why is that? He's going to be the class of 2030. We talk about those kind of trends all the time. 2030, 2050, by 2050 there's going to be another billion people or whatever it is. Let me tell you, it's here. For those of you that had kids and grandkids, it's here. It won't take very long until Kevin will be at this guy's graduation as he walks across the stage. So no wonder he has all the burdens. He's got to help us figure out how to feed another billion people or so. Thank you so much for coming. 186 voting members has to be some kind of record. Otis, I don't know, that's, that's the best I ever remember. But we appreciate your commitment to us. We appreciate the opportunity to serve you. Thank you very much for supporting your local co-op.